Happy Sabbath, everyone. Are you thankful to be in the house of God today? Man, I hope that all of us know that when we enter into the house of God, that there are blessings here for us. And if we anticipate these blessings, then we can receive them because God is faithful in supplying them to us. Now, where I'm passing out booklets, I ho- please, the litmus test is don't open the booklet until I'm ready for you to open it. Don't open the booklet until I see folk opening it already. Don't open the booklet until I'm ready. We're going to go through it. We're going to go through it. I want to thank uh, Sister Elena for that special music. I want to thank her husband, Pastor Jorge, for the invitation to come. And I'm here under the inspiration of God this morning. I ask God what it is that his people here at Kenya Memorial need to hear this morning. And so I believe that he directed me to this word, that he directed me to this word. So I'm asking today that if you want to hear God's voice clearly, If you want him to impress upon your heart what it is that he has to share with you today, what I want you to do is stand to your feet as I pray a special prayer today. If that's your desire, to hear God's voice and for him to give you exactly what you need today. Father God, we are thankful today for this opportunity once again to come into your house. I thank you for your love and for your mercy. There were alternatives that you could have chosen for us today, but you afforded us to come here to have the opportunity to hear your word. The devil will try to distract every one of us today, but I know greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, so I'm asking that you will kick him out of this building. Give us clarity that we may hear and know the truth because it will set us free in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning I'm going to share with you a word entitled doomed from the start. Doomed from the start. A few months ago, I was on my way. Uh, Sister Higgins, you can close that book up. Thank you. I was on my way to the store to pick up a few items. And the store that I wanted to go to was about 20 minutes away from the house. And so I picked up my keys and I got in the car. and, And by the time I got in the car, I heard a voice say, check to see if you have your wallet. And I was like, I got it. Uh, You know, I saw it not too long ago. I I got it. So I got in the car and I drove the 20 minutes and and I went in this particular store and, and I picked up the items that I was looking for. And I was in the checkout line and I put the items on on the belt and she brought them up and rang them up. And she said, that'll be so and so and so. And I reached to grab my wallet. And it wasn't there. I was doomed from the start. All the effort that I had put in driving uh, those 20 minutes, stopping at the red lights, trying to keep myself motivated from hitting other cars or blowing my horn. Everything I did, getting in the store, picking up those items, putting them in the cart, everything that I had done, was to no avail because I was doomed from the start. I want to share with you that this is a sobering message that I'm going to share with you today. I have spent all of my days in the Adventist church. My grandmother, my mother, third Adventist, uh, third generation Adventist, I am. I have spent every day in the Adventist church trained to be a pastor, gone to the school of learning, master's degree, all of those different things. They mean nothing, though. 
But when God showed me that this is where his people are today, that there are those who have been in the church for years and years and years, and the whole time that they have been here, their end is going to be destruction. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and I will read in your hearing verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 12. And if you have your pen, I want you to make sure uh, if something impresses you that you write it down. And I gave you the booklet so that you can go home later and study more about what we're talking about, what we will be talking about. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 12. If you have it, say amen, please. It says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet who, everybody? The bridegroom. And five of them were what? And five were what? So the Bible, is, the Bible is letting us know that of these ten virgins, five were wise and five were foolish. Now, if we split this church right down the middle, it would mean that five or half would be wise and the other half would be foolish. Now, I'm not going to say which side is foolish. Or, but that would be the reality of this story. That half of the folk who are sitting here are foolish and half would be wise. It says, they, they that were foolish took their lamps and took what, everybody? No oil. no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answer, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were what, everybody? went in with him to the marriage and what was the door was shut afterward came the other virgin saying Lord Lord open to us but he answered and said verily I say unto you what did he say I know you not, I know you not. open your booklets please open your booklets the first page we're going to look where it says as Christ this is from the spirit of prophecy. This is from Mrs. White writings. It says, as Christ sat looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom, he took his disciples, he told his disciples the story of the ten virgins by their experience, illustrated the experience of the church that shall live just before his second coming. What she is saying is that Christ was telling his disciples about the church, which is us. He's talking about us. The two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. Let me tell you something. All of us in here believe that there is a Lord. All of us in here believe that there is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Ghost. All of us believe that he is coming back one day. We have what is called a pure faith. There are those who profess and claim to be vegetarians. There are those who come to prayer meeting on Tuesday night here at the church. There are those who uh, have what they want, uh, a relationship with God. But the Bible tells us. That of all of those, there are some foolish and some wise. 
Look at what it says. By the lamp is represented what? Are you with me? Come on, talk to me. By the lamp is represented the what? The psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The oil is a symbol of who, everybody? The Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. In all of my years, I, I, I have come to understand that the word Holy Spirit, that talking about the Holy Spirit is taboo to the church. We don't talk about the Holy Spirit. We talk about Jesus. We talk about the Father. But you find very little conversation about the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit in this parable is the oil. Five of them took their lamps, the word of God, and took oil in a vessel with them. The other five took the word of God, but not the Holy Ghost. You need to hear me now. You need to ask God for discernment right now. Thus the spirit is represented in the prophecy of Zechariah. In the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. Are you with me? All had lamps and vessels. You see, God gave everybody a vessel for all. God gives you the capacity to know his word. He gives you what you need to be a soldier of the cross. He gives you what you need to be able to live a life that glorifies him. Because if he didn't, then Satan would be true. Satan had said before, nobody can live up to your standards. Nobody can keep the law. Nobody can live like Christ lived. But God has given us the Holy Spirit Amen. that we may be able to do this. It says, all had lamps and vessels for the oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. And let me tell you something. Just because you come and sit in the pew, just because you read the Bible, just because you come to the altar to pray, just because you say hallelujah, doesn't mean that you're wise. Doesn't mean that you have oil in your lamps. And God made it that way. The, the, the parable says that the wheats and the tares will grow together. And one of the workers said, should we separate them? God said, no, no, not right now. Because, see, tear looks like wheat. Hello. Tear looks like wheat. It talks like wheat. It raises his hand in holy praise like wheat. And here is what frightens me. I'm going to tell you what frightens me as an Adventist pastor. What frightens me is that the only person who knows the difference is God. Because we can even get, I heard uh, the teacher this morning talk about the fact that God will pull back his mercy and allow even those who profess to believe a lie. There are times when, when we will deceive our own selves if it were not for God, the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. Says for a time that seemed to be no different. So with the church that lives just before Christ is coming, all have a knowledge of the scripture. All have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect his appearance. But as in the parable, so it is now. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. Understand that now. They're not hypocrites. They're not putting on a show. So it's difficult to be able to tell. They have a love for God. They have a desire to go to heaven. So what makes the difference? Oh, 
This is why the devil doesn't mind us coming to church. He'll set your alarm clock and let you come to church. He'll wake you up. Hey, 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 time to go to church. Because he knows that coming to church is not going to save you. Ah, uh, you, you don't hear me. Coming to church is not going to save you. He knows that even, and, and you'll see this a little bit later, he knows that even you reading the Bible on your own is not going to save you. Because the Bible says this, Jesus says this, you search the scriptures, thinking in them that you find eternal life. He says you read the scriptures and you try to hold to your traditions. You try to hold standing up like a soldier reading the scriptures and say I know the scriptures. But he says the scriptures testify of me. Ah, wish I had time. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. The ten virgins are watching in the evening of this earth's history. All claim to be what, everybody? All have a call, a name, a lamp. All profess to be doing God's service. Man, we would look at them and say, those are good Christians. I want to be just like them. They got a call. They got a name. They got a desire to love God. All want to do is service. What is the difference? All apparently wait for Christ's appearing. But here it is. But five are unready. Five will be found surprised, dismayed, outside. We know that we are in the time when Christ is on his way back. We know that. We look at all the circumstances around this world and we know that God is on his way. Can you, can you gamble with your salvation? Some of us are doing that. Some of us are gambling with our salvation. You have been in this church what we call the truth for a long time and still are not ready. We are doomed from the start. That is the saddest condition I believe that Christians can be in. You think you're on your way to heaven and all of a sudden, you hear God say, I don't know you. But Lord, I, I, I was Sabbath school superintendent. I, I was an elder. I, 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 I helped folk to be saved. I don't know you. And then he says those eternal words, depart from me. Ah. How do we become doomed from the start? Here it is. You see it in your booklet on the next page. The first, the first way we become doomed is because they lack wisdom. All right? Turn in your Bible to Proverbs. I've written down the scriptures so you can check them later on, but I want you to turn to a few of them right now. Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Verse 6 through 15. You know what? No, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to take the time for that. Let's look at the clear word. You got the clear word, uh, uh, virgin, in your booklet. I put that in. This is Adventist base, all right? This is Adventist base for anybody who a little skeptical about the clear word. It's written by us, all right? It's in your booklet. This is Proverbs uh, chapter 2, verse 6 through 15. It is God. It is who, everybody? God. Who gives what? And what else? He is the source of all knowledge and understanding. Now, I asked people one time, I said, when I read this text, I said, who, who is this God? And folks said, that's Jesus. That's the Father. No, it's not. It's the other God. 
God the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us insight. It's the Holy Spirit that when somebody comes up to you and they're trying to talk to you and they're trying to smooth you and, and get on your good side, the Holy Spirit comes to you. If you have that relationship, he comes to you and he says, don't fall for that. He says, be careful. And even while you're talking, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. Say this. Say that. Ask them about this. Ask them about that. It is the Holy Spirit. This God that Proverbs is talking about is the Holy Spirit. He is the source of all knowledge and understanding. Look what else. He helps those who are upright and gives success to those who are blameless. He protects those who treat others fairly and watches over those who put their trust in him. You got to put your trust in the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus who said, told the disciples, he said, I got to go. He said, because when, when, when I came down from heaven, I put on a, a human robe. I put on a human body. I don't have omnipresence anymore. He says, but I'm going to send you a comforter. Somebody who can be everywhere with everybody at the same time. I'm going to send him and he will lead you. He will lead you. He will direct you. And yet, most of the places I've been over this country and outside of this country, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, folks start to get a little shaky. He protects those, verse 8, he protects those who treat other fairly. Okay, we read that. 9, when you acknowledge him, this, you will know what is right and just and what else? And will understand what course to take. When you acknowledge the Holy Ghost, when you pray, Father, let your spirit be with me. Let your spirit fall on me. What do you think it was when Elijah went up and Elisha said, I want a double portion of the spirit. He was saying, I want a closer relationship with the spirit that you got because I know that the Holy Spirit has power. I hope you're with me. Verse 11. No, verse 10. Wisdom will then come into your heart and knowledge will be a joy to you. Sound judgment will be at your side to help you and understanding will keep you from doing wrong. They will keep you from being deceived by wicked men and will protect you from people who talk too much. The Holy Spirit, somebody get to talking, and yeah, yeah, well, uh, uh, well, I don't like the pastor, I don't like the Holy Spirit, say, so you need to go on about, about your business. You, you do like this, I got to go. I can't talk with you anymore. You, the Holy Spirit will lead you. See, that we need to come to an understanding. That I had a Bible worker one time, and we were talking about the Holy Spirit and relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And she said one thing that, that made the young people who were working with us, they, they started chuckling. She said, before I go to the grocery store, she said, I get on my knees and I said, Lord, what store you want me to go to? And what items do you want me to pick up? And the young people start chuckling, what? You, you, you asked God uh, what store to go? She said, yes, I do. And the ones that he sent me to, she says, I end up spending less money and I end up getting all the bargains. And sometimes we don't think that God will help us in the minute things. But if he is the one who knows the number of hairs on your head, he cares about every aspect of who you are. There are many mistakes that I wish I had consulted God on. Because if I had done it, I would not have had to suffer. Because the Bible says he wants us to prosper and be in health. Prosperity is not only money. I've come to understand that the greatest prosperity that God can give me 
is peace. Uh, some of you may be too young to know that. But the older you get, you want peace. You, it's going to be in the top three. What do you want? I want peace. And the Bible says he will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on him. All right, I, I, I got to go. Turn to James chapter 3 and verse 17. We're talking about why they were doomed from the start. Because without the Holy Spirit, you can't have wisdom. You're walking around this earth foolishly. You're walking around making all sorts of mistakes, all getting in all sorts of trouble. So we lack wisdom because we don't lean on God, the Holy Spirit. We don't ask for the presence of the Spirit to be with us. The oil that the five foolish virgins didn't take was the Holy Spirit. James chapter 3, verse 17. If you have it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, but the wisdom that is from where, everybody? Above. Is what? Above. Then what else? Peaceful. Then what else? Yeah. And easy to be entreated. Full of what, everybody? Mercy. And good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. The Bible lets us know that when the Holy Spirit comes in you, you're going to calm down. You're going to be a delight. People are going to love to be around you. Man, folk running away from you right now don't want to talk to you. You might need to check to see if you got the Holy Spirit or not. You may need to to, to ask God, do I have the influence of the Holy Spirit working in my life? Turn to John chapter 16, verse 13. Got to give you some scripture. You already have them uh, written down in your booklet. I made sure that they are there. But I want to read a few of these. John chapter 16 and verse 13. Because I want you to know how important. You can't live a Christian life without the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. You can't have wisdom. It's impossible. John 16, 13. It says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. Now, now let, let me stop right there. It says, when the spirit of truth is come. We go around as Adventists saying that we have the truth. But if you ain't got the spirit, how you going to have the truth? Because he's the spirit of truth. All right, just put that down. The spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into how much truth? For he speak not of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you Things to come. Heard Charlie talk earlier about prophecy. It is the Holy Spirit that, that gives us discernment. You can pick up uh, Daniel and Revelation and try if you want to to make sense of it. It takes the Spirit of God to open it to your understanding. And if we're afraid of the Spirit of God, if we don't pray for the Spirit of God, if we don't ask the Spirit of God to open our minds to what is written in the pages, then we're just spinning our wheels. One more scripture on that. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Turn there quickly with me, please. I only got a few more minutes. Thank you. Romans chapter 8. Verse 26. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. If you have it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, likewise, the what, everybody? Spirit. Now talk about the Holy Spirit. Check this out. See, this is why you have to have the oil. We, if you've been around all of these years and not invoked the Spirit of God to come and to dwell in you and to dwell with you, then you have been missing out on major benefits. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Now, there's two ways that the Spirit helps you with your infirmities. 
The one is he tells you not to go into that situation so you won't get hurt. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. The Holy Spirit tells you, no, don't go down that street. Don't go over there. Stay out of there. So if you don't go, if you adhere to the voice before something happened, then you are not in a position to receive infirmities. But also, when infirmities come, I'm, I'm actually in my last unit of chaplaincy. In December, I'll be finished. But when I go into these rooms, I, I went into a room of a gentleman who actually used to live in Thomasville 20 years ago. And I met him at the hospital. He had a company here. Uh, his name is Joseph uh, Langston. He had a company here. I went into his room initially, and the doctors were saying he won't make it for a week. I met his wife who was standing there, and she was looking. When I walked by, what made me stop, she had a look of loneliness in her eyes that, that there was nothing that she could do. There was nobody she could depend on. And, and I stopped, and I walked in, and, and I said, uh, my name is Chaplain, so on, so on, so on. And we got to talk, and I said, well, well what's going on with Hunter? Well, they're saying that he's not going to make it through the week. So I said, well, let's pray. And I, and I called on the Father, and I said, I want you to send the Holy Spirit down here to touch this gentleman who they have said who, who's going to die in a few days. I said, but I know that you are the great physician, and through the Spirit of God, you can bless him. That brother is now on his way to rehab. And most of the doctors who come by, they are amazed at the progress that he has, he has made. But I know that the Holy Spirit can help our infirmities. Amen. I know he can do that. Amen. I know he can make a bad situation good. I know he can take all of our heartaches and give us joy. I know he can do that. I know he can do that. I see it every day. I watch him working. And the beauty of it is I'm not worthy. I watch the Holy Spirit take me as an instrument. I have no power. I have no right to anything. But here's what I know, that if you call on the name of God, if you avail yourself to the workings of the Holy Spirit, God will glorify himself through you. Amen. I know that. I know that. Look, look, look down where it says they are destitute in your booklet. Look in your booklet. It says they are destitute of the Holy Spirit. Look, look at that. Do you see it? It says without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of what? That means you can know the scriptures back and forward. If you don't have the Holy Spirit to open up, to show you, to direct you, you just read in words. The theory of truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may, that's why you see some people, some folk crying, some folk giving their life to God, and other folks sitting there with their arm crossed chewing, chewing gum. Because the Spirit of God is not moving them. In this congregation, there are at least four different categories of folks sitting here right now. Four. And yet, we claim to be one family. And the difference maker is the Spirit of God. Uh, one may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character. You, you read the rest of that. The character, what? There are people, unfortunately, who have been in the church a long time. They think the same way. They say the same thing. They treat people the same way. 
it caused a spirit has not had the opportunity to transform them. I'm going to give you an indicator. This is not in here, but I'm going to give you an indicator of how you can know you're in danger. When you start a sinner's wit, I don't, you're in trouble. You see, this church is divided right now. On, on the general conference level, we're, we're divided right now. Uh, uh, the bigger issue is that there are three conferences right now. And, and the reason that this church is getting ready to go through uh, a transformation, there will be those, it would be like Joshua, uh, not Joshua, yeah, be like Joshua standing back and he says, uh, uh, all those on the Lord's side, y'all come over here. And yet, it's going to be all Adventists. But the statement is going to be, all those on the Lord's side, y'all come over here. You see, there are three conferences right now that are, have voted to ordain women. Now, I, have a, I don't have an opinion to share with you whether that's right, wrong. That's, that's not my point. But my point is that if you, in your mind, in your heart, say, say these words, I don't, then you better check your relationship with God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because many times it has come when I'm talking to people, they say, well, I don't see nothing wrong with this. I don't see nothing wrong with that. Well, see, it's not what you see. It's not what you see. I use this illustration. You had a boyfriend. You had a boyfriend. And this is his picture right here. This is his picture your old boyfriend, but you met somebody new and you married them. You ran across that old picture of your old boyfriend, not your husband. The picture looks pretty good. You and him are in the picture and you decide to put the picture on the mantle. Now there are some folk who say, nothing wrong with that picture. What, what? It, it, She's not doing anything wrong. She should be able to put that picture on the mantle. It's a part of her past. And they can come up with some great arguments. But here comes the husband out of the garage after he's parked the car. And he walks in and he looks at that picture. He said, take that picture down. She said, no problem, honey. The reason she took it down it's not because she had a problem with it, but because he had a problem with it. This church has gotten to the place where we follow what we think, not what he thinks. You need to hear me. He told Jacob, Jacob said, Lord, I want to come before you. He told Jacob, he says, uh, before you come, take all the jewelry off your people. Take all your jewelry off your people. There are those who say nothing wrong with it. That may be true. But if he says, I don't like it, what are we supposed to do? And this is not to, to condemn anybody, but I'm, I'm just telling you that if we're not willing to follow the influence of the Holy Spirit, we are end up doing things that God is not pleased with. And he says, if you love me, do what I want. Do what I want. Not what you want. Do what I want. Oh, man, I got to hurry up. Lord, have mercy. Okay. That was just a commercial. It says, without the enlightenment of the spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. All right, enough of that. The second 
you see where it says the second reason that they're doomed from the start is they lack the ability to wait. They lack the ability to wait. It is not in our nature to be patient. And I'm telling you, every year we get less and less patient. When we sit down, we expect with the remote that it's going to change the channels immediately. If it doesn't, we're upset. We go down to Burger King, McDonald's, Wendy's, wherever you go. You expect it in a few minutes. When we are uh, uh, at the grocery store, we're trying, especially Walmart, we're trying to get less than 20 items so we can get in and get out. We, we, we're not accustomed anymore to being patient. We're not patient. And the Bible says that they all slept because God tarried. You see, if you want to test the character of somebody, make them wait. Make them wait. Well, what time are you going to be there? I'm going to be there at 3 o'clock. Get there at 4. <laughs> get, there, get there at 4 o'clock. And if they say, oh, I'm just so happy to see you, I'm just thankful you made it, then you know they got the Spirit of God inside of them. But if they, if they got a few choice words for you, you should have been here, I'm saying, and you're not here, and you're irresponsible, and, and I don't appreciate it because you don't respect me. Then you say, oh, Holy Spirit, fall down, rain down on them. But let's, let's read a couple of texts. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. I got to hurry up, so I'm not going to read all of them. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. Isaiah 40, 31. You got it. They lack the ability to wait. We're here to wait on God. We're here to wait on God. Sometimes God doesn't come when we want him to come. But when he comes, he comes on time. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. If you have it, say amen. amen. It says, but they that what? Upon the Lord shall do what? Now, now, do you know that if you wait for God, do you know that if you wait for God, your blessing is going to be bigger and better? That's what the, do you know that? The Bible says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I remember I was, uh, when I was here in Thomasville, when I was pastoring here in Thomasville, I bought my first Mercedes. Have mercy. I bought my first Mercedes. I always wanted one. So I saw one. And a friend of mine who had pastored here before me, Pastor Taylor, we were talking on the phone. And, and so I said, man, let's get these Mercedes. And he says, no, I'm, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for the Lord to give me mine. And these are the words he said to me. He said, I'm going to wait for the Lord to give me mine. I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and get mine. <laughs> so I, I saw Mercedes I liked in Valdosta, talked to the man, paid him the money. So I was driving around thinking I'm having a good time. I drove that Mercedes approximately 10 months before he got his. And he said, man, I got my Mercedes. I drove down to look at his. And here's what this text is talking about. When I got down and saw his Mercedes, his Mercedes was more expensive than mine. It was a higher series. It was a, a later year than mine. And he paid $4,000 less. I never forgot that. Because when we are impulsive, when we are so quick to move, then God doesn't have a chance to move things out of our way. The Spirit doesn't have opportunity to speak to us and direct us when we're quick to move. Sometimes we got to wait. It says, wait on the Lord. He'll renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and what? And not faint. And then one more scriptures. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And verse 5. Galatians chapter 5. And verse 5. Galatians 5 and 
verse 5. All right? Man, my time is, is moving quickly. All right? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5. If you have it, say amen. The Bible says, for we, through the what? What do we do? For what? All right? And the word righteousness, the word righteousness is translated right living. That's what uh, the word righteousness means. It means right living. So it says, for we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of right living by faith. It is the spirit. We wait for the spirit to move on us, to direct us on how to live right by us believing that the spirit will lead and direct us. That's what happens. Look at the underline. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it become a transforming power in the, light of the, in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their heart the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. The light of his glory, his character, is to shine forth in his followers. Let me move down. Don't have time. Number uh, where it says practical work. Practical work will have far more effect than mere sermonizing. We are to give food to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and shelter to the homeless. And we are called to do more than this. The wants of the soul, only the love of Christ can satisfy. Well, you got it there on the paper. You can read it later. All right, I got five minutes. Uh, point number three, and I'm going to try to do this in five minutes. Point number three, it says, thirdly, because they lack. Why, why are some of us doomed from the start? Because we lack a submissive will. This is the true reason. This is the overall reason. When I was doing the research for this message, this is the overall reason. Because it says that, that look, look, look down where it says, uh, they have a regard for the truth. You see that? They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth, which means they worked in the uh, prophecy seminar that you just had and the one coming up. You got folk who worked in that who are doomed. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not what everybody themselves to what that's what I said we look we 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 follow what we think I think I don't I don't see nothing wrong with that I don't see nothing wrong with us doing this I don't see anything wrong with us going here the five food and, and here's what the Bible says the Bible says that they were told by God Take extra oil with you. Take the Holy Spirit with you. Five said, we'll do it because God said it. The other five said, no, nah, we, we'll be all right. They would not submit their will to God. The song that should be our mantra for this church is all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely. I, I, Lord, you want it? Here it is. You want my house? You want my car? You want my time? You want my family? Here, God. I surrender everything to you because I know that I can trust in those 3,300 promises that you've given in your Bible. I know that you're faithful. You're faithful, God. The 
Bible says God sent out the 12 and then he sent out a group of 70 disciples. The 12 disciples and the 70. And they were getting ready to pack up everything. And they were getting ready to put some luggage and put stuff in luggage. He said, I don't want you to take anything with you. Don't take a change of clothes. Don't take food. Don't take money. And the Bible in the gospel says that they went out and they came back rejoicing because God supplied every need. What would it feel like for you and me to have had an experience of God supplying every need that we had? You would walk around Thomasville, around Cairo. You would walk around uh, uh, all of these places with a peace and a confidence. You would have a joy that nobody could take from you because you know that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they have you in their care. That's what God wants to give us. You can read the rest of it. But that's what God wants to give us. He wants to give us a sense of security, a sense of confidence, a sense of peace. But we got to submit our will to him. We have to be broken on the rock, Christ Jesus. Do you not know that most of the time the reason you catch hell is because God is trying to keep you from hell? So he gives you a little hell so that you will know what hell feels like to keep you from deciding I'm going to hell. I can't even imagine There are times when tears fill my eyes when I, when I think about the fact that, that I could go all of these years preaching the gospel and would have been doomed from the beginning because I didn't submit to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. Don't let the devil tell you that that you can come at the 11th hour and everything is going to fall in place. The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and do it not to him is sin. Now there will be those who will come at the 11th hour but not us. We're here now. We got opportunity to know now. We have opportunity to do now. We can't call for the 11th hour miracle. God wants to use us now. He wants us to submit now. You need not to be doomed from the time you came into this house. My plea to you today is that today you be honest with yourself, not me. Be honest with yourself. And you say, Lord, I know I'm doomed. I know I'm doomed. But I hear your word today. I hear your voice today. I hear you saying to me through your Holy Spirit that you want me to start anew. And, and, and that's the beauty of what God can do. He'll start you anew. He'll forgive you. He says if we confess He'll forgive. It, it won't be tomorrow. 
It'll be now. I, I didn't understand that for a long time. Even as an Adventist pastor, didn't understand that. That if I confess right now, he says, okay, it's done. And there are no residual judgment. I want to invite you to come. If you say, Lord, I'm, I want to start over. I don't want to be doomed. I don't want to spend whatever time before you come in a false worship, in a, in a false pretense. I, I don't want to do that. And when you come, I hear you say, I don't know you. See, but you got to be honest with yourself. You know, I, I've been places, I've talked to people who have deceived themselves to the point. When you start deceiving yourself, you are in extreme danger. Now the Spirit is saying right now, He's speaking to you. He's talking to your heart because He's faithful like that. I don't care what nobody knows about me. It's me, God, who's standing in the need of prayer. It's me. If you want to start anew, because you have in your mind some idea that you may be doomed with all that you've done for the years that you've been here, I want you to come up to this altar. Stand with me. Stand with me. And let's look to God. Oh, I surrender. Come on, sing it, everybody. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Come on, one more time. All to Jesus. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to Him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. Will ever love. In his presence daily live. Presence daily. Come on, sing it, everybody. standing at the front, join hands with those around you as we look to God today. Everybody's touching somebody. Oh God, our Father, we come before you, Lord. The devil constantly tells us that we are unworthy of any good thing and most of the time we have made his declaration true but I'm thankful today that through the Holy Spirit you have allowed us to see ourselves you have given us a path that we are able to take that will lead to the earth made new we ask in the name of Jesus Christ today that any failures, any hypocrisies, any selfish desires of this world will cease. We ask for a double portion of the Holy Spirit to fall upon each of us who stand recommitting ourselves to the Father, the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. We're thankful 
that the word says that if we ask, we can be assured that you will answer. We thank you, God, for loving us in spite of us. And now, to him that is able to keep us from falling, we surrender all. All to the Son who covered us with his blood, we surrender all. To him who will come back in the clouds and with the trumpet sounding so loud, wake up those who will be asleep. To new life, we surrender all. Our families, our jobs, ourselves, everything, we surrender all. And we give you praise and honor because you gave all. When you gave your son, when you gave your love, and when you gave us the comforter. Thank you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to the person to your left and right. Give them a hug. Tell them, God bless you. We're no longer. God bless you. God bless you, child. Thank you. Thank you, man. God bless you. Teresa.